doing okay? Goes good? <laughs> good. Glad you guys are here this morning. All right, so we're still working through 1 Samuel. We're getting close to the end. We have this weekend, we have next weekend, and then one more, and we're done. And then we'll move into Galatians, because I, I need a small New Testament book of the Bible without some really difficult Hebrew names in it. I just need that. I need to <laughs> cleanse my palate a little bit from... Uh, I've really enjoyed 1 Samuel. I hope you've enjoyed 1 Samuel. Um, working through it through, for quite some time now. And again, we're getting pretty close to the end. We're gonna do two chapters today. Last week, if you were not here, we did chapter 25. This is in the Old Testament. Predominantly a story of, and again, I say this every week, but just in case someone's new. Um, predominantly a story about the pursuit of the first king of the Jewish people, Saul. He is hunting down and trying to kill the second king, who is going to be the second king of the Jewish people, David. That's where we've been in the story. Okay, so the, 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 probably the last third of this book of the Bible, that's, that's really what it is. It's chapter by chapter going through just this, this pursuit of one king after the other. And um, Saul has become a very envious man, a very jealous man. Uh, he's kind of gone down the road of selfishness, which has led to a certain level of, of madness. And um, it, this continues to go on. And next week, there's a really fantastic, probably my favorite chapter of the entire book, where, where Saul even, even consults a, a medium and, and resorts to witchcraft uh, because his mind is so gone. But last week, we were in chapter 25, and there's kind of a break from the story of, of Saul and David. And it still focuses on David, but it focuses on David in a situation he had with a very rich man named Nabal and his wife, Abigail. And David essentially did, I'm really compressing it, David did a big favor for Nabal, asked for a favor in return. He needed food for his men and provisions for his men. And Nabal just kind of like, you know, snubbed him and said some bad derogatory stuff about him that set David off. And Abigail had to come in. She was a very intelligent, wise woman. The Bible says also a very attractive woman, a beautiful woman. She comes in. She resolves the situation. And in that chapter, it brings up things like uh, generosity. Are we generous? Do we have self-control? Because David kind of didn't at one point in it. Are we humble? And are we hungry? Not hungry like you're experiencing during this fast, a, a spiritual hunger. Do we have spiritual hunger? And so this is what we talked about last week. Now this week, we're gonna do two chapters. We're gonna do chapter 26 and 27 because they're both very, very short. And we're gonna talk about something that, that a lot of you, especially if you're like a mom in the room, you know about fatigue. It's like your whole life. Um, we're gonna talk about something that a lot of us experience. And that's just getting tired. And, and not just physically tired, like, like, like spiritually tired. What we're going to see in, in these two chapters is that David is worn out. He has been running. He has been pursued. Life is tough. And in this moment of weakness, he lets, he lets spiritual fatigue kind of set in. And here's the thing. When we grow spiritually tired, we, we make stupid decisions. When we're worn out and we're exhausted, we do foolish things. We do desperate things. And it usually doesn't end up very well. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today, this idea of, of spiritual fatigue and kind of the consequences of it. So you should have got a notes handout when you walked in. Everything is in there. Everything will be on the screen. Uh, we're in the Old Testament. We're in the ninth book of the Old Testament. We're going to do chapter 26 and chapter 27. 
If you happen to be a Hebrew scholar in phonetics, um, show me grace today because I am going to mispronounce some words. I have them written down phonetically right here to the best of my abilities. I've listened to them. I have studied them. I have tried to say them. Whenever you learn a different language, so very few people know this, I, I, I took Russian for, for four years and I speak a little bit. Uh, but when you learn a, a different language, especially one that's very different from, from what you're used to, sometimes it's just hard to say things. And so it's not that I've been lazy with these words, it's just I am not a Hebrew scholar and it's tough. So bear with me, show me some grace today. But uh, if you have the Experience Community app, just click on sermon notes, you got everything right there. So we should be in good shape. We should be ready to roll. So let's pray. Let's dive into these chapters, and um, we'll see where God takes us this morning. Thank you guys for, for being here, okay? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Lord, I thank you so much for everyone who's here this morning. God, I thank you uh, for the beautiful weather we've had the last couple of days. I, I thank you, God, for a safe, comfortable place where we can come and we can worship and we can break open the word and read it and learn from it. God, I pray as we do that today, God, that you would just bless this church. Keep your hand on this church. We pray not just for us, though. Father, we pray for every single church in our city. We pray for our other campuses and the churches in those cities, Lord. And we just pray that as we study today and learn a little bit, God, that in some small way, Lord, that we can bless you back and, and, and give back to you in some way. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. Pray all these things in your son's name, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, bear with me. This first part is kind of a chunk. We'll read it and we'll go back and uh, we'll work through these two chapters, okay? Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gabeah, saying, David is hiding on the hill in Hakaliah, opposite of Jeshimon. So Saul, accompanied by 3,000 of the fit young men of Israel, went immediately to the wilderness of Ziph to search for David there. Saul camped beside the road at the hill of Hakaliah, opposite of Jeshimon. David was living in the wilderness and discovered Saul had come there after him. So David sent out spies and knew for certain that Saul had come. Immediately, David went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw the place where Saul and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army, were lying down. Saul was lying inside the inner circle of the camp with the troops camped around him. Then David asked Ahimelech, the Hethite, and Joab's brother Abishai, son of zer ah i uh, there and say it slow, <laughs> who will go with me into the camp to Saul, who will go in with me into the camp of Saul? I'll go with you, answered Abishai. That night, David and Abishai came to the troops. Saul was lying there asleep in the inner circle of the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. Abner and the troops were lying around him. Then Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy to you. Let me thrust the spear through him into the ground just once. I won't have to strike him twice. But David said to him, don't destroy him. For who can lift a hand against the Lord's anointed and be innocent? David added, as the Lord lives, the Lord will certainly strike him down. Either his day will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. However, as the Lord is my witness, I will never lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. Instead, take the spear and the water jug by his head and let's go. So David took the spear and the water jug by Saul's head and they went their way. No one saw them, no one knew, and no one woke up. They all remained asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord came over them. David crossed to the other side and stood on top of the mountain at a distance. There was a considerable space between them. Then David shouted to the troops and to Abner, son of Ner, aren't you going to answer, Abner? Who are you who calls to the king, Abner asked. David called to Abner, you're a man, aren't you? Who in Israel is your equal? So why don't you protect your lord, the king, when the people came to destroy him? What you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, all of you deserve to die since you didn't protect your Lord, the Lord's anointed. Now look around. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were by his head? 
Okay, so once again, David is on the run. If you're with me a couple of weeks ago, Saul promised he would never do this again. Here we are again. Saul is on the run, or I'm sorry, David is on the run from Saul, and David is yet sold out again by a group of people that he was loosely related to, this time a group called the Ziphites. So they went to Saul, they told Saul where David was. When David realized that Saul was back to his old tricks, you know, and trying to catch him and kill him, he sent out spies just to confirm that this was going on. So that night, David and Abishai went to the spot where Saul and his army was sleeping. This is important. This is kind of those fun details. So what they would do is the king would sleep in the middle. There's 3,000 plus people there. The king would sleep in the middle. His commanding officer would sleep right next to him. And then they would put layers of people around the king. The reason why, it makes sense, because if someone's gonna come in and kill the king, you're gonna have to walk by a ton of people and more, li- more than likely you're gonna wake someone up, okay? But this is what David and Abishai, they were gonna go do, okay? They were gonna go spy and see what's going on here. So when David approached the, 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 the camp, he saw exactly what I just said, right? Saul in the middle, Abner, the commander of Saul's army, right next to Saul. He saw a jug of water next to Saul, and he saw the spear. If you've been here, the spear's become kind of famous if you've studied the book of 1 Samuel. The same spear that he, he threw at David and tried to kill him several chapters back, the same spear that he tried to kill his own son with, was stabbed into the ground right next to his head. Now, this spear was more than a spear. It was also kind of like a scepter. It was a royal, a, a, a sign of his kingship, his royalty. And that's important because David's gonna get it, give it back to him here in a second after he, he, he steals it from him. But this is what David sees, okay? So as they're looking at this, Abishai does what probably a lot of us would go through our brain. He goes, here is another golden opportunity, David. Like, you don't even have to do the dirty work. I'll do it. Let me go grab the spear. Let me run it through Saul. I won't even have to strike him twice. He'll be dead. All this will be over. You will be king. Everything's gonna be okay if you will just let me take care of it. But in this situation, I say in this situation because pretty soon we're gonna see that David goes the opposite direction. But in this situation, David has a level head. He is connected with God. He is obedient to God. And he says, no, we're not supposed to touch God's anointed. But let's talk like humans here for a second. That's what you and I are, I think. As humans, we have to be honest and and acknowledge the fact that the temptation to take the easy route is pretty strong most of the time. You know, I find it ironic. I'm not trying to be a dork here, but like we're 60 plus percent water and water has, it it, it always goes down the path of least resistance. It's what we want to do almost. It's like there's always this temptation and we have those voices all around us. Like why put the hard work in? Just do the easy stuff. Let someone else do it. Take the easy way out. The problem with the easy way out is it usually doesn't have good beneficial long-term results. We have to pay for it later, basically. But again, in this moment, David had a level head. We're not going to do that. We're not going to take it into our own hands. We're going to let God deal with it. He even says, God will either take his life one day when he grows old or, or he will die in battle. We'll let God take care of Saul's life. So if you're new here, it's not a bad question. What's the big deal about not touching God's appointed leader, God's anointed So the big deal about that is the instruction to not forcibly remove God's anointed is less about the person that God has chosen to lead, and it's more about his followers, us, right, and being obedient to him and learning a lesson from this. It's about us learning to trust God regardless if we have great leadership or regardless if we have awful leadership. There is a lesson in that. And so here is the tough truth that a lot of people in the United States, Christians, don't want to accept, is that sometimes God puts even evil people in leadership to humble and judge his people. It is a form of judgment. Saul was one of those people. God did not, it was not his intention to put Saul over the Jewish people, but they said, give us a king, give us a king. God goes, you don't need a king, I'm your king. We already have a good system. They said, no, 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 we want a king like the rest of the world. And God goes, okay, and you're gonna see how bad it's going to be. 
It was a judgment on his people to humble them, to correct them. Not only a a way to judge and humble us, and this has happened all throughout the Bible, and it still happens today, that God allows evil people to be in places of authority to, to, to humble us and to judge us at times. It's also an opportunity for us to learn balance, how to address the evils in the world, but do it in a way that still honors God. A great example from the 20th century is guys like Martin Luther King Jr., right? He was a pastor. He spoke out about an injustice. He spoke out about an evil in society, but he didn't light buildings on fire. He didn't kill people. He didn't sneak up on them in the middle of the night and stab a spear through them into the ground. He didn't do that. So there's a way to find balance to address the injustices in the world without doing it in a way that dishonors God that we speak truth, we also speak love, and we even love, as Jesus says, our enemies. Is this easy? Of course not. But we mature and strengthen as Christians, even when God puts people above us that, that, that are not good people. I love this part. This is good. So David gets the spear, he gets the jug, he goes up on a, on a mountainside, he looks out over the camp, it says he's a considerable distance away. There's only two guys and then there's an army of thousands right there. It's not really a fair fight. So they get a little bit of distance away before David turns around and starts yelling at the head of Saul's army. And I love how he starts off. He goes, hey, Abner, you're a man, right? It's kind of hurtful. You know, you're a man, right? And then he chastises the heck out of Abner, basically saying that he's not a man at all. You haven't honored God by protecting your, your, your king. You fell asleep on the job. You're lazy. You lack respect. You lack worth, work ethic. He tears Abner down in front of everyone. Now, this is important, and I'm going to tell you why. And some of you may not like this, but, you know, here we are. So all Christians, all Christians are to demonstrate honoring God, right, and how we live. All Christians are to be excellent. What I mean is that we do the best we can with whatever situation we're in. We work hard, right? We have a strong work ethic, and we show respect. Now, all Christians are to be examples of that, but we're going to take it up a notch. I think there is a unique challenge biblically on men to be examples of these things. You guys good? Listen, in my opinion, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, the degradation of society has been a result of the degradation of godly men. There is a problem with men in our society. Listen, if your wife has drug you to church today, that's not the way it's supposed to be. If it's only your wife that prays for your kids, that's not the way it's supposed to be. If your wife is carrying the bulk of the work all the time, right? That's not the way it's supposed to be. Now, do I think men are greater than women? No, I do not. But biblically speaking, there is, a, there is a unique challenge that are placed on men to be providers, protectors, to be leaders. And that doesn't mean that women don't complement that and walk along that. But, but if you even look, and if you think I'm just pulling stuff out of nowhere, there are so many collegiate secular studies from Ivy League universities that are done that are starting to show us the ramifications of fatherless homes in the world. The kids are more likely to drop out of school, like 300% more likely to drop out of school. They don't have a dad in their life. They're more likely to go to jail. They're more likely to get someone pregnant or get pregnant when they're teenagers and they're not married. There are all kinds of ramifications because when the male is not being what God wants them to be, a lot falls apart. I find it interesting that David goes, hey, aren't you a man? Now listen, a man is not a guy that like chews tobacco, drives a big truck and like bench presses 400 pounds. (laughs) If you do those things, great. One of them's really bad for your gums, so you should probably stop. But the other things, that's fine. But society's version of a man, that is not the biblical definition of a man. A biblical definition of a man is much different than that, okay? We need to make sure that we understand. If you're a man in here, it's time to step up, man, because not only does God want you to, the world needs us. Society needs us, okay? All right. There's a woman back there that's like, that's right, get him, Corey. Get him. (laughs) Saul recognized David's voice and asked, is that your voice, my son David? It is my voice, my Lord and King. David said, then he continued, why is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? What crime have I committed? Now may my Lord, the King, please hear the words of his servants. If it is the Lord who has incited you against me, 
then may he accept an offering. But if it is people, may they be cursed in the presence of the Lord, for they have banished me from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go and worship other gods. So don't let my blood fall to the ground far from the Lord's presence, for the king of Israel has come out to search for a single flea, like one who pursues a partridge, a bird, in the mountains. Saul responded, I have sinned. Come back, my son David. I will never harm you again, because today you have considered my life precious. I have been a fool. I've committed a grave error. David answered, here's the king's spear. Have one of the young men come over and get it. The Lord will repay every man for his righteousness and his loyalty. I wasn't willing to lift my hand against the Lord's anointed, even though the Lord handed you over to me today. Just as I considered your life valuable today, so may the Lord consider my life valuable and rescue me from all trouble. Saul said to David, you are blessed, my son David. You will certainly do great things and will also prevail. Then David went his way and Saul returned home. Sounds familiar. We heard this a couple of chapters ago, right? So all the shouting between Abner and David, of course, this wakes up Saul because he's right next to Abner. And we kind of get a little bit of a window on just essentially how crazy and how unstable, that's a better word, how unstable Saul has become. This is a guy who is hunting David down to kill him. And now all of a sudden he hears David's voice and he goes, David, is that you, my son? Is that you, my son? And he feels this instant remorse. This is important. Look, If we are walking in a relationship with Jesus, if we're walking in a relationship with Jesus, we will mature into decisive and consistent people. What I mean by decisive there, don't get worried if you're like one of those people that can't decide where to go to lunch every day. I'm one of those two. (laughs) That kind of indecisiveness is not what I'm talking about. When I say decisive here, when we're in a relationship with Jesus, we are decisive on what is right and what is wrong. We are firm on what is right and what is wrong, how we are to live. Not only are we firm on what is right and wrong, we are consistent in how we live it, how we execute it. So if we do not walk in a relationship with Jesus, we're prone to instability. When we're not in a relationship and we're not banking on the ultimate truth of God's word, we blow with the winds of culture. That's what we do. And we become insecure and we can drive it. It can drive us to do crazy things to act way out of character, right? To flip-flop on on things, to, to not be consistent in our thinking. It can drive us to madness. So this is very, very important that we're in a relationship with Jesus. We're stable, decisive, consistent people. So again, David says to Saul, why are you hunting me down? What have I done? What crime have I committed? And David even sincerely says, this is a good lesson for us. David even takes the high road and goes, if I have wronged you, If God has you pursuing me because I've done something wrong, I will offer a sacrifice to God. I will repent. I will say I'm sorry to God and that I'm sorry to you. He also says to Saul, though, if this is because of your peers, if you're not hearing from God, but your peers are telling you to pursue me, you're all going to be cursed. So here's what we learn. One is Christians, whenever we get into a confrontation or a conflict, we should take the high road and approach that conflict by saying, listen, if I have done anything wrong, tell me and I will ask for your forgiveness and I will ask for God's forgiveness, right? That's a good, humble way to approach conflict. Now, if you haven't done anything wrong, you don't have to worry about it. But if you have, fix it. The second thing is this. We need to be careful that we stand firm on what we know to be true and not let outside voices detour us from what we know to be true. That's what Saul let happen. He let these talking heads get in and it made him think things that were not true. They persuaded him in the wrong direction. David also reminds Saul that God will repay me. God will repay me for my loyalty. God will repay me for my righteousness. And he also says, I really like this. I find it interesting. David goes, because I have valued your life, God will value my life. Now, listen, that doesn't mean that if you're in here and you don't value other people, that God doesn't love you and and value you. He does. But what this means is 
is when we do what Jesus said to, to treat others the way we want to be treated, we are honoring God by valuing other people. And when we value other people, God protects us. He keeps his hand on us. He provides for us. That's what he's saying. Because I have honored you, Saul, God is going to honor me. That's what he means by that. So faith in hard times like this builds character. What do we do? Well, Jesus told us what to do, not only in the good times, but in the bad times as well. Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus tells us. When we seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus said, everything else will be added to you. That doesn't mean you're gonna get the car you want and the house you want and everything's gonna be easy and perfect all the time. That's not what Jesus meant. Jesus said, when our first priority is God and his kingdom, the rest of our priorities start to stack up the way they should. That's what he meant, right? We seek first the kingdom of God. And when we seek first the kingdom of God, we learn to be faithful and content people when? All the time. Doesn't mean life's easy. But we can have joy when the world doesn't have joy. We can have peace when the world is in chaos, right? We can have freedom when the world is in shackles. We can have those things. And we also need to remember that we reap what we sow. Now listen, the Christian should not believe in karma. Karma is not a Christian thing. I hear a lot of Christians say that, oh, that's bad karma. Listen, not only is karma an Eastern philosophical thing that is not biblical, karma is a bad gig if you actually know what karma is. I'm glad that we don't believe in karma and that karma is not a real thing. Karma says that there is a scale. And on this scale, we have all the evil things we have done in this life. And, and, and karma's teaching is, is that the only way for things to work out in our favor is if we do more good to outweigh the bad. Now, for some of us in this room, we have a lot of stuff on this side of the scale, right? And unfortunately, there's not enough good that we can do to undo all the bad that we've done. But that's not how it works in Jesus's economy. In Jesus's economy, if we sow into a relationship with Jesus, we reap mercy and grace and forgiveness, right? And that erases the evil of the past and the scale works in our favor. So whenever Christians say, oh, it's bad karma, we reap what we sow. <laughs> We reap, I don't know what I was doing. Let me move on. <laughs> so at the end of this situation, we saw this a couple of chapters ago. It looks like Saul is repentant. He humbles himself again. I was wrong. You were right. God's going to bless you. I've done so many evil things. Certainly you will do great things. And David goes his way and Saul goes his way. And once again, God has delivered David, but he's about to forget that. And we are going to see just how bad things can get. Listen to me. We're going to see just how bad things can get when we forget that God provides. When we take God's provisions for granted and we forget to, to memorialize those things or remember those things. Okay, here we go. Next part, chapter 27. David said to himself, one of these days, I'll be swept away by Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I'll escape from him. So David set out with 600 men and went over to Achish, son of Maok, the king of Gath. David and his men stayed with Achish and Gath. Each man had his family with him. And David had his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. When it was reported to Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Now David said to Achish, if I have found favor with you, let me be given a place in one of the outlying towns so I can live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? That day, Achish gave Ziklag to David, and it still belongs to the kings of Judah today. The length of time that David stayed in the Philistine territory amounted to one year and four months. Now, if you're new to Christianity, especially if you're new to the Old Testament, the Philistines, were, they were enemies. That was enemy territory. Remember that. So listen, David, David is the guy that miraculously killed a giant and saved his nation. David is the guy who was miraculously delivered from Saul multiple times. God had his hands all over David. But somewhere along the line, he forgot all the things that God had done for him in the past, 
and fear started to slip in. Well, what if Saul catches up with me? Doubt started to creep in. And when fear and doubt start to creep in, we start to take situations into our own hands. Hey, you need to hear this this morning, and we need to get it deep into our skulls, our thick skulls, right? God did not create us in his image, and God did not send his only son to die for our sins just so we can be delivered and fail later on. Did you hear me? God did not make us in his image and send his son to die on the cross for us just for us to fail just for us to not be delivered, just for us not to be saved, just for us to not have the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit that we should be demonstrating in this life. We have to establish the reputation of God in our mind that he loves us. And and, and if we look back on our lives, think of all the mountains that God has helped us to scale. And there's going to be more mountains, but if we forget the previous mountains that God has helped us overcome, when another one comes up, we freak out. And we let fear come in and we let doubt come in. But we have to remember, man, God has gotten me over mountains before because he loves me, because he's on my side, right? Because I'm made in his image and his son died for me on the cross. And we need to remember these fundamental facts because here's what will happen. If doubt creeps in, doubt will lead us into places that we shouldn't be. David took his men into enemy territory. And they met a king, Achish, which we read about in chapter 21. David acted like he was insane so this guy wouldn't kill him. And now he's submitting himself to him. And though this strategy stops Saul, there was short-term results to this, right? It stopped Saul from chasing him for a minute. He could settle down for a second. But in order to get that, oh man, hear me. In order to get that momentary sense of relief, he had to drift into dangerous territory. So doubting God, doubting God, look, doubting God diminishes our ability to be wise and to discern. Why? Because when we doubt God, we're not walking in fellowship with the Spirit of God. And it's through the Spirit of God that we get the gift of wisdom, we get the gift of discernment. And when we lack those gifts, we tend to venture into places that we shouldn't be. Do you want to know why the majority, we're going to talk about porn for a second. Good, you do that in church? Well, the fact that 70% of all men and about 40% of all women get addicted to it at one point in their life should be reason enough for us to talk about it in church. So let's talk about porn for a second. The majority of people look at pornography not because they're sex-crazed maniacs, the, 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 the vast majority of people who look at pornography, it's because it's their way of dealing with depression. It's a controllable way to deal with anger or to escape or to, to handle insecurities. It's a way to get out of the world, out of reality, into this made-up fantasy. That's why they do it. And so what happens is this, when we struggle with depression, when we struggle with anxiety, when we struggle with troubles with our marriage or whatever, instead of running to God, if we don't find sanctuary in God, we're going to find sanctuary somewhere. And so a lot of people drift into this, right? They drift into things like pornography. They venture into places where they just shouldn't be. And it may give you a temporary sense of relief, but there's going to be long-term ramifications. And so David was in a pagan area submitting to a pagan authority because he was afraid, because doubt had crept in. Now, this is a king that made sacrifices to false gods, and he would make his subjects, David was now one, also make sacrifices to false gods. So though it doesn't blatantly tell us, when we see what David does here in a second, it's no stretch to say that David probably made sacrifices to false gods. It's the same thing with us. When doubt leads us to places we shouldn't be, we start to compromise things that we should know are right, and we start to make sacrifices to lesser gods. What are you talking about, Corey? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. When we refuse to go to God and we start to drift into other things to get our sense of security and value and comfort and everything else, we surround ourselves and and put ourselves in environments that speak things contrary to the word of God. And what happens is is if we're there for a long period of time, David was there for a year and four months, when we're there for a long period of time, we start to whittle away and compromise our truth. 
Corey, what do you mean? What I mean is, when we're not in the Word of God and we're not in a relationship with God, we might make friends who don't believe in God or they worship gods that don't really exist. I'm not trying to be controversial today, but maybe they're Islamic, maybe they're Hindu, maybe they're Buddhist, maybe you know they're Baha'i, whatever the case may be. But because those people are really friendly and nice to us, we start to compromise absolute truths and we go, well, maybe there are multiple pathways to the same center. Now listen, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings today or, or, or be a jerk, but we cannot call ourselves a Christian and believe that there are multiple pathways to the same source. Well, Corey, how can you say that? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. He's saying, I am the only path. I am the key, he is saying. But what happens is, is we start to make sacrifices to the gods of political correctness. And we start to make sacrifices to the God of the approval of man. And we start to make sacrifices to the gods of affirmation. That's what we do when we're hanging out in environments that we shouldn't be in. We're in we're, when we're in a headspace that we shouldn't be in, our integrity starts to get whittled away. And that's what was happening to David. You know, even though David was acting like an idiot right here, and we're going to see just how much of an idiot he's acting like, God was still working. So Achish gave him an area called Ziklag. It's kind of a fun name for a town. He said, you can have Ziklag. Now, what was interesting is once upon a time that was occupied by the Jews, but it had been taken over by the Philistines. But now because of where David was and what was going on, that area was going to go back to the Jewish people and stay with the Jewish people. So what we learn is, God will still work out his will even when we're being fools. But does that give us an excuse to be fools? No. Does it give us an excuse to sin? Absolutely not. But God in his grace and his mercy and God sees our entire lifespan, he still does things even when we're not where we're supposed to be. So David let doubt and fear slip in. You know what else David did? He started viewing himself as a victim and self-pity slipped in. David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites. From ancient times, they had been the inhabitants of the region through Shur, as far as the land of Egypt. Listen to this. Whenever David attacked the land, he did not leave a single person alive, either man or woman, but he took flocks, herds, donkeys, camels, and clothing. Then he came back to Achish, who inquired, where did you raid today? David replied, the south country of Judah, the south country of the Jerom, you alites, or the south country of the Kenites. David did not let a man or woman live to be brought to Gath, for he said, they will inform on us and say, this is what David did. Let me pause there for a second. So David was raiding innocent areas, right? They weren't Jewish areas. They were non-Jewish, so they didn't believe in God. But anyways, he would raid these innocent areas, kill everyone. And because he was afraid someone would tell on him, he would kill other people that he suspected on telling on him. That's where David's at right now. This was David's custom during the whole time he stayed in the Philistine territory. So Achish trusted David thinking, since he has made himself repulsive to his people Israel, he'll be my servant forever. At that time, the Philistines gathered their military units into one army to fight against Israel. So Achish said to David, you know, of course, that you and your men will march out in the army with me. David replied to Achish, good, you'll find out what your servant can do. So Achish said to David, very well, I will appoint you as my permanent bodyguard. So in order to not be forced to go to war with his own people, David would go into Gentile areas. He would slaughter the whole communities, pillage and take all of their stuff. And then he would tell Achish, oh, oh, I went to areas of Judah and I raided them today. So, so Achish gets the idea that he's attacking his own people, but he's not. He's attacking Achish's people, killing all of them and then killing all the people that may rat him out. So fear not only led to selfishness, fear led to lying and hurting other people. And this path became his custom. That means his character. Listen, the whole time David was in a place he shouldn't have been, it changed his character. 
Now, if one slips up and does something in a heat of passion or a fit of anger, and if it's an isolated event, now that's an isolated event. It's still a sin. We need to repent for it, but it's not a consistent thing. But if you do that sin every day or every week or every once in a while, and it's consistent, that's not a slip up. That's your character. That's your custom. And people say asinine things like, well, what I do doesn't define me. If what you do doesn't define you, what in the world does define you? Your words? A lot of people saying I'm a Christian and they in no way live the way the Bible tells them to live. Words mean very little nowadays. Actions mean quite a bit. And it was his custom to do evil things during that time. So when we start down the path of doubting God, when we start down the path of self-preservation, we gravitate towards people, towards places, towards things that lead us into deeper, deeper, darker sex of sin. And so here's the thing about sin. Sin has an insatiable appetite. It is not satisfied with just a little destruction and chaos. It wants total destruction. We know that because Jesus even said about the devil, it is the devil's desire to steal, kill, destroy. And if we are not careful... Sin will take even decent people, right? Who start off decent, normal people. Sin will take us to shockingly disturbing places if we do not repent of it. There was a man in Pennsylvania last week, right? All of his neighbors said he was a normal guy, nice guy. Everyone thought he was a really decent dude. Posted a video on YouTube of him decapitating his father and cooking the head. Everyone said he was just a normal guy, lived there for decades, And listen, I know that's an extreme case, but if we do not let God get a grip on our heart and on our minds, there is no telling to what depths we can go to. People that you never thought would cheat on their spouse or never thought would abuse their children or never thought would steal from their work. But sin has an insatiable appetite. It wants to destroy. And so David would eventually be forgiven. Okay, I just want to let the cat out of that bag. Eventually, David's going to turn it around and give his life back to God. But there were ramifications for his sin. Wait a second, Corey, are you saying there's still a price to pay even if God forgives us? Absolutely. And in David's case, when he eventually wanted to build the temple of God in Jerusalem, God said, no. You have too much blood on your hands. It says that in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. You're forgiven of those things, but, but your reputation has been marred. And so you can't build my temple. His son eventually built the temple. So here's the thing with us. God is quick to forgive us. I think we talked about this last week or the week before. God is quick to forgive us, but there still may be ramifications for the things that we do. We've already gone to uncomfortable territory this morning. So let's say someone in this room commits statutory rape, right? Let's say you're 22. You have sex with a 16-year-old, a minor. God can forgive you of that. You're probably gonna have to do some jail time and pay back your debt to society. But even though God has forgiven you, even though you've paid back your debt to society, you're going to be on a list for the rest of your life. I'm not trying to be mean and I'm not trying to be cold. But what I'm saying is it proves the point that there is, there is always a cost for evil. There's always a cost for sin. God forgives, but there is still a cost for these things. This is why the Bible even says that sexual sin is a sin against yourself. It's not just a sin against God. That particular sin has ramifications that affect you even after forgiveness. Again, I'm not saying this to like scare you or make you feel bad or anything like that, but we need to know that. Sin carries weight. We can't just do it and be like, God, forgive me, and then like you never go to jail, nothing ever happens, nothing's bad. There's always a price. So David was gaining approval from a pagan king. He was gaining approval from a bunch of disgruntled Jewish people who hated Saul, but in God's eyes, he was failing. He was sinking. He was being rebellious and evil. And we do this. Sometimes our selfish scheming, it may, it may impress some people, right? Our quick fixes may impress some people. It may even get us some relief temporarily. The problem is, though, is that God sees it all. And that our, our, our resorting to quick fixes versus God will have long-term results that will not be in our favor. So we need to make sure that we're leaning on him, So here's the thing. There is a lot of trust, or I'm sorry, a lot of benefits when we trust and and are loyal to God. Practical benefits of being loyal to God. When we're loyal to God, when David was loyal to God, when he was patient and when he trusted God, he walked in the security of God. 
He walked in the wisdom of God, the provision of God. He walked in the discernment so he could make wise choices. Even though, listen, even though life wasn't easy for David, when David was walking with God, he knew how to navigate life. He knew how to go down the right paths when he was trusting God. And the same thing is true for us. If we will be in relationship with Jesus in the good times and in the bad times, we will have wisdom. The world is very confusing, guys. We need the gift of wisdom. We need discernment, and we can have those things. The world is very discontent. That's why they go to these ridiculous lengths to try to find something to fill that void in their life. But we as Christians can have contentment if we have a relationship with God. We can have fulfilling lives. We can have peace. Even when there's chaos everywhere around us, we can have these things, but we have to trust God. We have to be loyal in our relationship with God. There are benefits to that. Now, if there are benefits to loyalty, there is a danger when we start to let fear and doubt creep in, okay? When we lack faith in God, when we lack obedience to God, this is when things start to get scary. This is when doubt starts to weasel its way in. And this is where we get desperate and we start, to try, start, start taking things into our own hands. And when we take things into our own hands, we start to gravitate towards people that we shouldn't be around. We start to gravitate towards places that we shouldn't be hanging out in. We start to gravitate towards things that we find value and comfort and pleasure in that we shouldn't. That's what happens. And what happens is, is we have forgotten that God loves us, that God wants to be in a relationship with us, that God wants us to trust him, that God wants the best for us. Jeremiah, right? 29, I have good plans for you. We forget that God wants us to, to, to succeed. What I mean by succeed is he wants us to be saved. He wants us to be changed. He wants us to be restored. He wants healthy marriages and healthy friendships and healthy uh, uh, family dynamics. He wants those things for us. And we have to remember that. And that helps us keep that fear and that doubt out. If I will get it in my thick skull that God loves me, and that God wants the best for me, then that protects me from fear and doubt creeping in. Not only are, is there a danger of fear and doubt creeping in, here's a, here's a good one. I was really proud of myself this week when I wrote this. Whenever we start looking at ourselves as a victim, there is a danger in that as well. Oh, Saul is pursuing me again. Oh, life is so hard. Everything is so bad. My life is so unique to the other 8 billion people on planet Earth. We say things like, man, the devil is out to get me. The devil is not omnipotent and not omnipresent. So if you think of all 8 billion people that the devil just hones in on you, a little arrogant, isn't it? I'm not saying there's not demonic forces that are at play, but we just think that we are unique to all other people on planet Earth. We're victims. And what happens is this. When we play the victim, it naturally makes everyone else our enemy. What do I mean by that? What happens is when we're the victim, right? That I deserve more. It's all about me. It's all about me. Why is life so bad for me? We start to sit on the porch of our 2,500 square foot house and we look at our neighbor with the 4,000 square foot house and we go, why do they have that and I only have this? Why do they get to drive that Mercedes and I'm just driving this Honda over here? Maybe it's because they have a PhD and they work 60 hours a week and you don't. You know what the, you know what the point is? It's none of your business what your neighbor has. That's the sin of envy. Do you know it's one of, the, it's one of the Ten Commandments? It's one of the top ten bad things you can do in life, is be envious of your... It's none of your business what your neighbor is doing. But what happens is when we play the victim, we start to become entitled. We start thinking that we are owed everything, and we start looking and comparing ourselves to everyone else and going, well, why do they get to do that and I don't? It's not your business. What your neighbor has is between them and God, and what you have is between you and God. And so what happens when we start to claim to be the victim, everyone else is against us, and we start to not only rationalize, but we justify jealousy and envy. We rationalize and justify a hatred of other people. We say things like, eat the rich, because those people have things that I don't have. I hate them. That is a sin, brothers and sisters. That's wrong. 
when we hate people because of things we have or don't have, but we're playing the victim and we even justify violence. Several years ago, when there was rioting going on all over the country, there was a legitimate justification for people to be upset. There was a legitimate reason that people should be mad. There was no justification for barging into a Korean man's store in D.C. and curb stomping him to death on the street. There's no justification for that. But what happens is, is when we're a victim, I'm allowed to attack you because you're the enemy. I'm allowed to hurt you. The bottom line is this. It is important to remember that God gives, God takes away. What we have or don't have is contingent on God. And here's the other thing. God owes you and God owes me nothing. You want to know who else doesn't owe you anything? I don't owe you anything. And you know what? You don't owe me anything. What we have is between ourselves and the Lord. And we're to trust him. We're to work hard. We're to be ethical in how we live. And God will give and God will take away as God sees fit. There is this danger of letting this victim mentality creep into our hearts because it makes everyone else an enemy. Here's the thing. Like David, I think David got tired. David had been running from his enemy. David had been struggling. David was supposed to be the king on a throne and David was living in caves. He was sleeping on the ground. And what can happen with us is in this life, the tension of life, the pushback of life, the adversity of life can start to beat us down. It's just being honest in here. I hope you're, I hope you're honest with yourself in here. It is easy to get fatigued, spiritually fatigued. And then it's very easy for us to resort to destructive behavior. When I get stressed, it's a lot easier to just hop online and look at something to relieve me of that stress really quickly than it is to go to God in prayer or go to counsel or, or confess my faults to someone or whatever the case may be. So we must intentionally guard ourselves from getting where David got. David got tired, and in his fatigue, he justified death, he justified murder, he justified theft, he justified sacrificing to false gods. He went down a dark road because he was tired. We need to make sure we don't go down that same road. So how do we do it? How do we do it? There's a lot of ways to do it. The first thing is this. As Christians, you and I are called to pour out. We're called to pour back out as a church into our city. We're called as husbands and wives to pour into our spouses. We're called as parents to pour into our children. We're called as neighbors to pour into our friends. We're we're called as students to pour into the people next to us. We're called to be pouring out. The thing is, though, it is impossible for us to pour out unless we are continually being poured into. A glass can only spill what it contains, correct? Correct. So something has to be poured into us. How do we do that? How do we get poured into? Well, the first thing is you being here today. This is good. The church should be full and and, and every church should be full. Church should be a major priority to Christians. Whenever professing Christians say you don't have to go to church, my first response is show me one scripture that even remotely supports what you're saying. It's not there. From the beginning of, of civilization and God's people all the way through the book of Revelation, The church meeting together corporately at least once a week is biblical. Why? Because it encourages us. It fills us up. I know the church is not a building. I know the church is a people, but you need to be around those people. We need to come together and sing corporately together. We need to read the word of God and study together. We need to take communion together. It's important. It's biblical. Book of Hebrews says, do not stop the the assembling of yourselves together as many people have done. You need church. Glad you're here. We also need personal accountability. We need people in our lives that love us enough to ask us the hard questions. If they don't see us for a while, that they call us, that they, 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 they keep up with us, that they're looking out for us. Some of us may even need to go further than that and have legitimate counseling. I said this a couple of years ago. I've been going to a counselor for about six years now. I go out in Franklin. He's a Christian counselor. He's 16 years older than me. He's a good man. He's not a, a, a therapist. He's not a psychiatrist. He is someone that just counsels pastors. And I've been going to him once a month for six years. It's been great. Went and saw him last week. I said this about four years ago. And I got a really happy email from a really happy lady that said I was a weak pastor for admitting to my congregation that I see a counselor. 
And I just said, ma'am, you're at the wrong church. If you want some fake guy that puts on an expensive suit and is secretly doing all kinds of stuff that he shouldn't do because he's too prideful to tell anyone that he struggles, by all means, there's a lot of churches for you to go to. This ain't the one. And I say that if you're in this room and you need a little bit more than just someone to hold you accountable, nothing wrong with that. That's why the Bible says, confess your faults one to another and fulfill the will of God. That these are things that there's nothing wrong with seeking counsel. We need to be praying personal prayer time that we need to have intentional time set aside to where we talk to God. We need to be ingesting the word of God. The word of God is not only encouraging, it tells us how we are to live. And that if we follow the principles of that book, we do walk in wisdom. We do walk in discernment. We do see better better marriages and better ways to raise our children, even better ways to handle our finances and work at our jobs. It's all in there. So ingest that wisdom. Here's a big one. We need to, if we're not going to get fatigued and if we're going to be filled up, we need to intentionally choose time to meditate and be thankful for the goodness of God. You hear me? That means we need to set aside time and just think on how good God is. Just to kind of sit in that for a minute. It's even beneficial. I've started opening up a lot of my prayers with, God, you are the creator of the universe. You are the one that made all of humanity. You hold the beginning and the end in your hands. You're the one that spoke the universe into existence. And listen, God already knows all that. But when I say these things to him and think on the goodness of him, it comforts me because the God that created it all sees me and he knows me and he loves me and he wants to be in relationship with me. So when I think on the goodness of God, it gives me peace. It gives me comfort. It fills me up. And then the last thing is Sabbath has to be a part of your life. In the New Testament, it talks that Sabbath is not a specific day of the week. Sabbath is a way that we live, that we intentionally set aside time to be with God, to to not zone out and watch eight hours of Netflix. Oh, I'm Sabbathing. That's not Sabbath. (laughs) Sabbath is getting by yourself with God and letting God recharge you intentionally doing these things. I'm going to tell you guys, man, and you know, you, you already know this. The world will wear you out. Adversity will wear you out. We have got to take steps to make sure that we don't get spiritually fatigued because when we're tired, we do foolish things. And we can do a lot of damage when we do foolish things. Okay? Would you bow your heads with me, please?